Well, happy end of spring break. How are you all doing this morning? Oh, the cold has taken the energy right out of you, right? Isn't it just like Indiana to tease us with warm weather and then during spring break send us snow? I don't know. That's how it always seemed to go. Anyway, hey, I'm so glad you're with us. Uh, my name's Seth. I'm one of the pastors here. Thanks for those of you joining us online. Even if you're joining us from the beach, as much as we hate you, get a sunburn, or hope you get a sunburn and hate you for it. Um, <laughs> We're glad you can be with us. Um, I'm actually taking my own kind of spring break trip tomorrow. I'm leaving to go to Israel for two weeks, or roughly two weeks. So I'm really excited about that. I'll be back with you all uh, Palm Sunday. So look forward to that. All right, so we're finishing up a series today called Relationship Rules. And um, I wanted to start off sharing about an experience I had years ago. When I was a brand new um, out-of-college youth pastor, I was hired as a pastor of youth and children at my church. And the youth group thought it would be fun to welcome me by giving me a special gift. And the special gift they gave me were 50 cans, kind of like this. No labels on it, or roughly 50 cans. You know? And so um, they thought, you know, hey, you're living on your own for the first time. Wouldn't it be great if we gave you a bunch of food? But we won't tell you what it is. <clears throat> Would it be soup? Would it be vegetables? Would it be fruit? Who would know? It would be an adventure and a mystery. So I thought to start us off today, we'd do something kind of fun, and we're going to play a little game. Anybody like games? Yeah, okay. All right. We're gonna, I've got a volunteer, a voluntold, Amber Cochran. Come on up, Amber. I, I talked to Amber beforehand. And so um, we're going to have a little game where we've got these three cans. Um, and so you can shake them, you can like smell them if you want. I don't know, that's kind of weird, but you could. <laughs> you don't smell the cans, okay. Um, and then we have little labels, soup, vegetables, and fruit, okay? okay. Do you cook a lot, Amber? Um, here and there, I'm more baked. Okay, so this might be a little hard for you. Yeah. All right, all right. So we have special music for this exciting moment. Let's go ahead and cue the music. Okay, so what I didn't tell you is my volunteer from first service got them all wrong. Okay, so here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna let you open each one and pour it in there. Okay, so the first one, Amber thinks is soup. Are you, how convinced are you? I'm pretty convinced. Okay. Oh. (laughs) Oh, that stinks, doesn't it? (laughs) It's garbanzo beans, I think. Yeah, there you go. Okay, that's vegetables. All right. Next one. Well, we know that's not vegetables. Should we see what's inside? What do you think it's going to be? You want to guess again? Um, I'm going to say, now I'm going to say fruit. Fruit, okay. (laughs) All right. Let's see how your relabel went. Oh, Oh, it's wrong again. No, it's not. It's soup. It's soup. I got it. I got cherries. That was, okay, good try. And then we've got the last one. Well, technically, I was right the first time. You got one so, right. Yeah, you got exactly. one right. Okay, isn't that great? Back? Yeah, you can, <laughs> there you go. We got peaches. We got peaches. All right. How fun is that? Well, we have a nice parting gift for you, Amber, for participating, um, even though you didn't get very many right. And because it's St. Patrick's <laughs> weekend, we got you lucky charms because the leprechaun always has to make an appearance. Thanks for playing along. Give everybody, give Amber a hand. All right. <laughs> and you're all like, what was the point of that? <laughs> the point is that our labels aren't always accurate, are they? What we think is on the inside isn't always what's on the inside. So we're going to talk about that as we finish our series, Relationship Rules, three rules that I think if you were to put them into place in all of your relationships, it would make your relationships better. The first rule that we talked about was I choose to respond rather than react. We'll get that one up there. I choose to respond rather than react. We said last week you are response able. You're able to choose. You have control over the quality of your relationship. Therefore, you are response able. You have an obligation. You have a responsibility to respond rather than simply react. Because whenever we react, and you know this, it leads us to doing regretful things. It leads us to saying regretful things and wishing that we could take things back.
back, which is pretty difficult to do. So instead, I'm going to choose to respond, and the way I respond <laughs> is by starting my day by deciding to put on something. We introduce these, these things that we're going to choose what to wear. I'm going to put on compassion and kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, forgiveness, and love. And if you didn't get one of our window clings that can go on your bathroom mirror, uh, you feel free to stop by guest services after the service. We still have a few of those left. But the point is that these are things that don't come naturally to me. What comes naturally is the opposite. And so I'm going to choose to respond by praying that God would help me to put these things on today because these are not who I naturally am. And then last week we introduced number two, relationship rule number two. And rule number two is I choose to fill the gap with trust before suspicion. That in all of our relationships, we have kind of expectations and desires, and then we have the other person's behavior. And the distance between those, the gap between those, is where we tend to fill it with suspicion. I don't know about the rest of you, but I tend to be a conclusion jumper. Any other conclusion jumpers willing to admit, like, I jump to conclusions about what the other person was doing or thinking or, you know, what, what was happening or why they responded the way they did. But instead, we have to choose to fill the gap with trust before suspicion. I'm not going to assume the worst about the other person. I'm going to believe the best. Or another way of saying it is I'm not going to write a bad story about that person in my mind. I'm going to choose to believe that they have good intentions, that they are on my team, that they are for me as much as I am hopefully for them. Now that brings us to today as we're going to talk about labels, not just the labels that get placed on us, but the labels we place on other people. And I have a hunch, and my hunch is that at some point in your life, you have been incorrectly labeled. Is that true? Maybe it was in high school, you're so lazy. Your parents looked at you, you're so lazy. Or in middle school, you're so awkward. Actually, that's a correct label that we probably all had. But, you know, you, you, in college, you know, you're so privileged. You're so privileged. Or the person you're dating, you're so controlling. Or maybe your parents, you're so unreasonable. You're so unfair, right? Kids, you say that to your parents. You're so, oh, I can't believe it. You know, or your coworkers say, you're so unapproachable. You're so unapproachable. Sometimes we have labels that we can't shake things that have been applied to us at one point in time, and it's almost like somebody has put us inside a box and they put the label on it, and we can't get out. Like, as, as hard as we tried, we want to be someone different, we, we become someone different, but that label, it just kind of sticks to us. And so, so we know we've been incorrectly labeled. That's my first hunch. My second hunch is that incorrect labels hurt. I don't they? Because they assume something about us. They assume the worst often. They assume we can't change. They assume that we can't be different. They assume that I'm the same person today as I was 10 years ago. You're the same you you were 15 years ago, back when I dated you, back when, you know, I I have assumptions about you. That's kind of my story. I grew up in a small town about the size of Batesville. When I graduated high school, I had gone to school with almost everybody in my graduating class. There were about 117 of us. And so for 12, 13 years, we've all been together. And, you know, you change a lot over 12, 13 years, don't you? And for, one, for me, I mean, one of the journeys God has been taking me on is showing grace to other people. But I felt like by the time I became a senior in high school, I couldn't shake this label of, of the way that I treated other people. Sometimes labels stick to us, and the incorrect labels can be hurtful to us. And and we don't like labels. We fight against labels sometimes. But the interesting thing is that as much as we don't like being labeled, and it's true, none of us really likes the being labeled, but as much as we don't like being labeled, we're awfully good, aren't we, at labeling other people, right? Right? Isn't that funny that as much as you don't like being labeled, we're awfully good at labeling other people? I mean, think about the labels that you and I have applied to other people. Sometimes good, sometimes bad. Things like lazy or controlling, addicted, dramatic, goody-goody, greedy, deadbeat, privileged, unapproachable, incompetent, distracted, troublemaker, friendly, wise, untrustworthy, foolish, attractive, ugly, too fat, too thin, too beefy, clingy, smart, dumb, workaholic. I mean, you've probably used almost all of those labels at some point in time, and apply them to someone else. That as much as we don't like being labeled, we are so good at labeling other people. And do you know why I think we don't mind labeling other people? It's simple. We're convinced our labels are accurate, aren't we? I dated one of those before. 
I was married to one of those the first time. I, my friend, you know, has a sister like that or a brother like that. And it's like we ultimately come to this idea that, that oh, we've got a story for that person and we just go for it. Now, there's a piece of, of brain science in here that allows us to stereotype, allows us to label, because our brains actually, you may not know this, but our brains are kind of lazy. Our brains like to take the shortcut to get everywhere, and I don't want to have to figure you out every time I meet you. That's a lot of work, and so I'll just apply a label. And so it's kind of natural. That's what happens to us. We apply labels, and it's not necessarily all bad, but the problem comes in when we make labeling errors. There are a couple labeling errors that we make. The first one is mislabeling, having the wrong contents. Right? We, it's one thing to mislabel a can, as I set Amber up to do, because I made sure all the cans sounded and felt the exact same when you shook them. I know, I was cruel, wasn't it? And, you know, proving a point. But it's one thing to mislabel a can. It's another thing to mislabel a person, isn't it? It's one thing to assume the contents of the can are wrong it's, or different. It's another thing to assume the contents of a person are different. And then to treat that person based on the label that we've applied to them. That's why clinging to the wrong labels can be so hurtful. So that's the first error. The second error is failing to change the labels once we realize the contents don't match. It's making a person stick in that spot. That's what happened to me in school. Like I couldn't wait to go to college because I had changed so much and I wanted a new label. But I felt like the people around me assumed they knew me because they did no part of me, and they kept me within that label. And so this rule that we're going to talk about today in our third relationship rule, what it's going to do is it's going to help us to see the best in other people, not just the best in some people, because we're good at seeing the best in some people, right? I mean, there are people in your life that we're oh so good at showing grace and patience to, and it's like, oh, you know, they could almost do anything bad they wanted to us, and we wouldn't care. We'd still love them. We'd be so patient. But then there are other people in our lives who irritate the crud out of us, and it doesn't matter what they do. We just assume they're trying to get under our skin. They just frustrate us to no end. We show grace to some people always, and grace to other, or not grace to other people, like always, right? And have you ever wondered why we do that? It really comes down to perspective. See, you and I know this, that perspective is powerful when it comes to how we label others. Perspective is why you can go to a restaurant and your friend is a brand new server. First night there, and you're like, oh, let's go. Let's support them. We want to show up and let them know how much we care about them. And then, you know, they take your order. You ordered a Diet Coke. They bring you Sprite. And you're like, oh, it doesn't matter. I like Sprite. I preferred Sprite. That's what I wanted, you know? And I didn't want any refills. I know you're busy, you know? And, uh, and yes, my, my steak is mooing at me, but I actually prefer to take it home and cook it to a reasonable temperature and the comfort of my own home. And when the bill comes and there were no refills and the service was awful and they mischarge you for stuff, you leave them a big tip. And you're like, oh, you know, it's their first night. We want to be so encouraging to them because, you know, we, we want them to know they're doing a great job. And then you can go to the restaurant another time and you have some server that you don't know and you don't know if this person is lazy, you don't know if they're just a terrible server, if they didn't sleep, if it's their first night or whatever. And they bring you water, you ordered a Diet Coke. And they're like, I didn't order this. This isn't what I wanted, you know? And you, you put the tip on the table. You ever seen this happen? You put the tip on the table, you start taking dollar bills off of it. And it's like, okay, you know? And then you ordered a salad with dressing on the side. It comes drenched, you can't eat that. And you know, the chicken comes back grilled, you want it fried the steak is overdone, and you're just like, All right, let me talk to the manager. This is ridiculous, right? And then you just say, I'm not leaving them a good tip because they, they gave me terrible service. Why, why can we treat one person one way and another person the other way? It comes down to our perspective. It comes down to our perspective. And it's because perspective is so powerful that I think Paul wanted us to understand and see God's perspective, in fact, if you've ever wondered what God's perspective is, he sent his son Jesus down to earth to show us what God is like. He wanted us to understand who God is. And he pointed to, to God. Jesus pointed to God. And so what Paul does, and this is so important, this is what we're going to look at as we uncover this rule, is, okay, how does God treat people? How does God see people? What is God's perspective on the you next to you? 
What's God's perspective on the you that you work with or who sits at the lunch table or is on your team or you, you sits across the, you know, from the, the line of desks from you? I mean, how, what does God see? Who, how does God see people? And so the Apostle Paul, he wrote this letter, it was written to the Christians who were living in the city of Rome, often referred to, the letters referred to as Romans. And in this, um, he, he gives us a very familiar verse. If you've been around here for a while, we've talked about this before, but it's so important. We're going to tease it out a little bit, and then I have some extra kind of newer stuff. But here's what he says, Romans chapter 5, verse 6. He says, you see, at just the right time while we were still powerless... And when he's talking about this, he, he's, he's writing this to Christians. So these are people who have claimed a Christian worldview that they believe that Jesus truly you know, is the son of God. They've trusted in him. He says, in your relationship with God, when we were still powerless, he's talking about in our relationship with God, you're powerless. And do you know why, do you, know why you and I are powerless in our relationship with God? Because we don't have anything God needs. There's nothing God needs. So there's, there's nothing that we can be like, oh, pay attention to me. Oh, God, you, you owe this to me because I've done this for you. It's like, he doesn't, he doesn't need that. So we're powerless in our relationship with God. But instead of being put off by our sinfulness, instead of being put off by who we are, instead of being put off by our brokenness, Paul says this. He says, while we were still powerless at just the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. And in his death, Jesus did something that none of us could earn, none of us deserved. He gave us an unexpected label. He looked at the contents here and he said, it's not what it appears to be on the outside. You know how he labeled us? He labeled us as valuable, as worthy, as loved. See, do you know how you determine the value of something? It's not a trick question, I promise. You know how do you determine the value of something? Here's how you do it. The value of something is determined by how much someone will pay for it. And God looked at you, and he looked at me, and he looked at the you next to you, and all the people you work with, and the people who irritate you and frustrate you, and he looked at your parents, he looked at your siblings, a crazy, you know, whatever relative, and he said, you are valuable. In fact, if you're here today and, and you're just kind of struggling to believe that you're valuable, you should just know this, that God has, has given you the label of valuable because he said when you were at your worst state, in fact, Paul would go on to say when you were enemies with God, he sent his son to die for you, to forgive you. And when he died for you, he ascribed to you infinite, infinite value, which by the way is unnatural, isn't it? Throughout this series, as I mentioned, we're talking about doing what's unnatural. God did what is unnatural to value something that seemingly had very little value. To value something that, that had kind of given God the middle finger, who had raised its fist against God. It's a little unusual, isn't it, for a king to give his life for his unruly subjects. It's one thing for the subjects to give their life for the king, but for the king to come down and give his life for the unruly subjects, that's different, that's unique. That's otherworldly. That is actually, if you're curious, it's one of the reasons why I believe what's written and what Paul wrote, because no human being would come up with this idea that I would give my life for someone else. In fact, here's, here's what Paul went on to say. He said this. He said, very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. It's a little unusual to trade your life for someone else. Sometimes you hear the stories of somebody gave their life to save a baby or children or, you know, plane, you know, the World Trade Center, I think about that, when people gave their lives to keep the plane from flying into the Pentagon. I mean, so, I mean, there are times when people do this. It's unusual. But Paul's point is that we're not good people. Very rarely will someone die for a righteous person, but when we're sinful people, when we're hurting ourselves, when we're hurting the people we care about, when we're hurting God... Why would he do this? Paul says, God does it in spite of us. He goes on, he says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He died for you. He died for you and you and you and you and you and every single person in this room and every single person living in the community of Batesville and every single person living in southeastern Indiana and the United States and across the globe who's ever lived for all time that God has placed an incredible value on them. 
Now, I demonstrate things for my kids sometimes. Coaches demonstrate things, right? Teachers demonstrate things. But, but what God did is he demonstrated what love looks like. And do you know what love looks like? It looks like total generosity of yourself. Love means giving yourself away, which is why God's love labels us as worth dying for. That's what God's love does for you and for me. It says priceless. I would give, you, I would give anything for your life. I would even give my son now again, it's normal for, for subjects to give their lives for a king, but for the king to give his life for a subject, it's absolutely unheard of, let alone the rebellious subjects. But the point that Paul's trying to make is that God looks at you with so much value. And he tried to help us understand the implications of it. Because here, here are the implications. That if God is willing to die for this person, who am I to label them as anything less than worth dying for myself? If God's willing to send his son for the person who irritates me, for the person that our culture says is worthless, whose life is worthless, if God's willing to say, I'll send my son to die for that person, who am I to label them as anything different? And so Paul, he would go on in this letter, he'd say, don't be conformed to the pattern of this world because the pattern of this world is to label people based on what the culture thinks the value is. But instead be transformed by the renewing of your mind because God wants to do something new in you and he wants you to see the world from a different point of view. He wants you to see the world from his point of view because when you see as God sees, you will do as God says. And when you begin to understand the amazing value of all people, It helps you. It reframes their behavior. It reframes your relationship. It says, I have an obligation, not just an obligation, but I have an invitation to view this person differently. Throughout chapter 12 uh, of Romans, Paul tries to help us do this. And so here's the first thing he says. He says, love must be sincere. Love must be sincere. Another way of saying that is love must be genuine. In other words, love has to reflect the person who is love and who defined love, and that person is Jesus. And so he defined love by being generous with himself. And so our love, likewise, has to follow suit. Love isn't defined by our culture. Again, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Don't be conformed to the pattern of this world. He continued on. He says, be devoted to one another in love. Now, this is kind of interesting because in Greek, there are three words that get translated to love. And this time he used the word Philadelphia, which is like brotherly love. You've heard the city Philadelphia. It means city of brotherly love. This is the type of love you have in a family. This is the type of love you have for that crazy aunt or crazy uncle or crazy sibling or crazy parent or whatever. And if you're not sure who the crazy person is in your family... You may be it, right? We're just saying. I mean, you know, so, but but what Paul's saying is that in the context of a family relationship, you've got a, a love for each other. Even for that crazy person, there's a seat at the table, isn't there? That the holidays, you, you make room, there's a seat at the table, you're included. We value you in spite of the fact that you're a little nutty. I could say that about all of us in the room. You're all a little nutty and I value you anyway. That's the type of love that Paul's talking about. So he says, look, you need to be devoted to one another that way. And then he goes on. He says, honor one another above yourselves. Now, the word honor means to ascribe value, to respect someone, to kind of raise somebody's status. In other words, what Paul's saying is that we should be competing to uplift each other. When's the last time you uplifted a server at a restaurant? who was bringing you food versus, where's my food? I didn't order this. You did it wrong. I mean, really, when's the last time you uplifted somebody like that and honored them? When's the last time you honored somebody in community kids who serves downstairs and just pours their heart into the next generation and says, we care about you and we value you? When's the last time you honored them? When's the last time you honored somebody in guest services who comes early every week to, to shake your hand and say, we're so glad you're here? When's the last time you honored the person collecting carts at Kroger or stocking the shelves or moving things at Kroger? I mean, when's the last time you you celebrated that and said, thank you, thank you for making my life difficult because it's teaching me how easy things were before. I mean, right, I mean, when we choose to honor other people, it, it, it raises their value. Don't you like it when people honor you? When somebody says, man, you're such a good parent. I mean, you you do such a great job at work. 
I, you keep your yard immaculate. I mean, when people honor us, it makes us feel good, doesn't it? That's what Paul says. That's, that's what we're to do to each other. He went on, he said this. He said, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse, which doesn't sound very fun. It's like, why? They don't deserve it. Why? My boss doesn't deserve it. He's a jerk. My ex doesn't deserve it. You should see the messages they've sent me. You know, the people at Kroger don't deserve it because they redesigned everything on me. And the answer to that is because God demonstrated love for you. He blessed you. He gave you something you didn't deserve. And so you don't do it because the other person deserves it in your mind. You don't do it because you think they've earned it. You do it because that's what's been modeled for you. See, God labeled all of those people. He looked at them and he said, you're worth my son's death. You're worth my son dying on the cross. You are so valuable. See, you know what Paul's inviting us into? Something that he would talk about in the book of Galatians. It's called the law of Christ. You know what the law of Christ is? We talk about this sometimes. It's to love others as Jesus loved us. And let me tell you, it's hard, if not impossible, without God's help. Again, it's not natural, which is why we need God's help. We need to pray that God help me to love other people the way you've loved me, because I'm not very good at it, and I get frustrated. It's countercultural because our world is eye for an eye or tit for tat or payback's not a good thing. I mean, that's the way our world looks at things. But Paul says, no, 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 you have an obligation. When you open yourself up to God's work in you, again, this is for the followers of Jesus. You're not following Jesus yet. I hope this is something you'll be inspired to, but it's not an obligation for you. For those of us who claim to be Christians, this is an obligation that God's work, God's love is working through me and it's pouring out of me into the lives of other people. That's the law of Christ, to love others as he loved us, to bless them, to honor them, to uplift them, to pray for them, to see them as God sees them. Later on, he says this. He says, do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. Now, when you tell someone to be careful, it's because you're in dangerous territory, right? And so what I think Paul's saying is like, look, there's a risk here because when we repay evil for evil, that's the natural thing. Don't do it because it never results in something good. It creates a wedge in you and the other person. Our invitation, and again, our obligation is to move toward restoration with other people, which is why we don't repay evil for evil. Instead, do what's right. And the truth is people know what's right, don't they? The world knows what's right. Even liars know what's right. I don't know if you ever thought about this before, but liars don't like being lied to. They know what's right. Even if they're not living it out, they know what's right and they want people to treat them right. And when you do treat someone right, they know and it has the potential of changing their lives. That's where Paul's going to move in this. He's going to tell us that when we treat other people the way that God has treated us, the power of the Holy Spirit begins working on their insides. And if they'll just pay attention to it, if they'll just listen to that still small voice of the Holy Spirit prompting them, their hearts will change and they'll begin moving in a different direction. They'll begin moving in the direction of God, which is a win. We should all celebrate that. They should be moving in the direction of restoration in our relationship with them, which is a win. We should be celebrating that. Do what Jesus did. He didn't seek payback. He goes on, he says, if it is possible, and it may not be, but if it is, as far as it depends on you, and it doesn't always depend on you, let's be honest, but as, if possible, as far as it depends on you, he says, live at peace with everyone. Live at peace with everyone. You can do your best to live at peace. He goes on, verse 19. He says, do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. What Paul's saying is that at some point in time, God's patience it's going to wear out. His forbearance, which is like a withholding of judgment, is a big theological term, it just means God's withholding judgment for a period of time. It's going to wear out. At some point in time, God will take up the role of judge. For now, he's withheld that. So let God deal with that. Let God deal with that. In the meantime, you do what's right. You do what's right. You be at peace. You do what you can to be at peace with those around you. And then he quotes Jesus in the book of Proverbs. He continues on. Here's what he says. Uh, stick this next verse up for me. It says, on the contrary, on the contrary, instead of seeking revenge, he says, if your enemy's hungry, feed him. 
If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. And in doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head, which is a nice way of saying you'll make him feel really guilty because he's been a jerk and you haven't. And he didn't deserve you to be kind, but you were kind. Or she didn't deserve the way you were treating him, but you treated him that way anyway. And then he gets to the point. Here's what he says. He says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Again, the point being that God can begin working in a person's heart. God can begin doing something in them. And that as followers of Jesus, that there is no room for us ever to be unkind. There is no room for us ever to dishonor because we know the label Jesus has placed on every single person we're around. He has labeled them as valuable. That he's labeled them as worth his life. And even if they don't see it, even if they don't respond to our kindness, even if they don't respond to our honoring and blessing them, the world around us sees it, don't they? The world around us sees it, and it can be inspirational to them, and God is still working, and God is actually glorified to that, because when we do that, we're reflecting Christ in us. That's what to glorify God means. It just means that we reflect God in us. So we're reflecting God in us and God begins moving in them and he begins moving in the people around us and God is ultimately glorified. So that brings us to our second rule or our third rule rather, not our second rule. And our third rule, we're gonna stick it up here on the screen is that I choose to treat every person as someone Jesus died for. Because they are, and he did. And even your ex, as bad as he or she has been, Jesus looked at that person and said, I'll give my life for you. And even that impatient person who causes you to lose your patience and get really frustrated, Jesus said, I care about you. And even the one who hurts your son or your daughter, or your sibling or friend, right? I mean, you know, God looks at that person and says, I... I die for you. And so love says, I'm not going to respond in anger even though you've shown me anger. I'm not going to respond in disrespect because God doesn't want to see his children being disrespectful to one another. I'm not going to lash out even though I want to. When you write something about me on social media, I'm not going to use my keyboard courage behind my screen. I'll restrain these evil thumbs to let the vengeance belong to the Lord. That's what Paul's saying. I'll treat other people this way because I might not know their story, but I know their value. I do. They have value in their label, which is worth dying for. Any Antiques Roadshow fans in the room? you? Yeah, a couple of you know, my wife, Carrie, she's a big Antiques Roadshow fan. Uh, for those of you who don't know what the show is, it's on PBS, and there are basically these roadshows where people will bring in their, their treasures or junk, we're not really sure what, and they have somebody there who has experience in valuing these types of things, and every once in a while, I'll, I'll catch a part of an episode, and we were watching one a few weeks ago, and there, there's this woman who brought this piece of junk. I think she found it in a basement or something. It's like people get this at the rummage sale or in a garage or it's a family heirloom that everybody wonders, why are we passing this down from generation to generation? But they bring it hoping that it's worth something. And you take this ugly thing that doesn't look like it's very valuable, and you put it in the hands of a collector, and the collector says, you have no idea what you've got here. This thing is of inestimable worth. And you think, I wish I had one of those in my basement, right? (laughs) Because now you're rich. But but that's the point. That's the point of all of this, that that Jesus looks at all those people where they're dusty and crusty on the outside, and we're not really sure we like them, and there's, eh, you know, whatever. But, But Jesus looks at them and says, oh, they have so much value. He says, do that for each other. I had a friend once who shared the idea that if you want to know how to value somebody, you know, what you do is you just imagine everybody you meet with a 10 on their forehead. Then on a scale of one to 10, they're a 10. So just go ahead and assume they're a 10 and you're going to figure out how they got it later on, right? But, but just assume that they're a 10 because they are, Jesus has given them that label. So if you want to build stronger relationships, those three rules, put them into practice. I choose to respond rather than react. 
I choose to fill the gap with trust before suspicion. I choose to treat every person as someone Jesus died for because they are, and he did, and he died for you and me too. In spite of our addictions, in spite of our failures, in spite of our impatience, in spite of our harshness, in spite of our drama, in spite of the hurt that we've inflicted on other people. And so if he loves me for who I am, which he does, sometimes we think, you know, if he loves me for who I am, why do I need to change? Well, it's because he loves us too much to leave us that way. So if he loves me, who am I to not love this other person? Just like with Antiques Roadshow, if we can just take that person to Jesus, if we can just take him there and allow the one who valued them to help us to see their value, say that you are worth so much. Listen, there are people in your life who have incredible value and they are just waiting for you to bring them to the feet of Jesus where he can say, their life matters so much. But we have to be willing to do that. Again, not a follower of Jesus. You do what you want. But if you're a follower of Jesus, this is not just an invitation. It is an obligation that we see each person as someone in whom God has placed incredible value. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, I know this is hard especially when we've been hurt, when people have not treated us the way we deserve to be treated. We get frustrated, our emotions get caught up in it. Father, for the person in the room who maybe is just struggling in a relationship, I I pray that you would help them to see the value of that other person. As difficult as it may be, Father, thank you for the value you've placed on each one of us that you have called us love, that you have called us your children, that you have given your son's life to give us value. Would you help us in turn to bring people to you and allow you to value them the way you do and help us to see them for who they are and how you see them. God, give each one of us wisdom to know what we need to do with what we've heard today. And then God, give us the courage to do it. We ask that you would watch over us in all of our relationships. Help us to move in your direction. Help us to have strong relationships that are honoring and pleasing to you. Thank you for this time, Father. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.